In this video, I want to speak about the uh, education philosophy of writer and education critic John Holt, who wrote such books as How Children Fail and How Children Learn. So I'm a professor in a college of education, and I'm on a summer break, so I have a little bit of time to do a little bit more reading. So I've been reading some of John Holt's works and actually rereading some of them, because I read a few of his works a few years ago. Uh, so I've read How Children Fail, How Children Learn, um, Freedom and Beyond, um, Learning All the Time, books like that. And I want to do this video about the themes of John Holt's work because unlike a lot of other education writers like John Dewey and Lev Vygotsky that are kind of standard in education, uh, Holt is pretty unsystematic. And I think that leads a lot of folks to read him and not really appreciate maybe the sophistication of his work. I know I didn't really appreciate it when I first read him, but I've been rereading some of his works and reading new ones. And uh, it really dawns on me that a lot of his work is very sophisticated. It just maybe isn't presented as systematically as possible. So in this video, I want to talk about three themes that I think really underlie his work and tie them to kind of current educational thought, because I think they're pretty sophisticated and have a lot to add to current education debates. The themes that I see in John Holt's work that I want to bring in here are these. So the first is that he's kind of noticed that that's students often treat school as some sort of game or set of hoops to jump through. And that actually gets in the way of their learning. So that, I think, is the central point in John Holt's work. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Secondly, uh, maybe a minor theme that he doesn't bring up as much, but I think is really important to, to my understanding of Holt, is the negative impact of things like um, setting time limits for students to learn this by. So we're going to learn this by the end of this week. And then we're going to take a test on it and you're going to be rewarded or penalized based on how well you do on it. So I think Holt really points out in a way he doesn't really always make clear that that is a really negative thing for the learning process. And the third aspect that I want to bring up is Holt's firm belief that children really want to have access to the adult world. They really want in some ways to be as adult as possible. And our job, he thinks, is not to treat them as if they're children who are kind of separate and apart, but as people who are kind of gradually entering the community of adults. First, a brief mention of who John Holt was, because unlike writers like Dewey, um, John Holt's writings are actually very personal. He tells a lot of personal anecdotes, personal experience. So you really need to understand who he is in order to figure out what he's up to. So he wrote his first book, How Children Fail, while he was a teacher in Denver, Colorado. And I believe he was also a teacher in Denver when he wrote his second book, kind of a, an accompaniment called How Children Learn. And during these years, he's writing as a way to try to think through why students and children learn in the way they do when they're in school. And it seems like a really superficial way to learn. So he's trying to puzzle through all this. In the first several years of his writing, he's a, he seems to be an advocate that we can really simply reform schools. So if children are learning in a way because the structure of schooling kind of tells them to do it that way, well, you can just change the structure and you'll maybe change the behavior. And it became evident to him after a while that he... Um, thought that maybe the problem was actually schools themselves. Maybe the structural changes he's asking for are a little bit too big for actual schools to accomplish. So he's thinking at this point, maybe the, the, what we should actually be doing is trying to get students into other environments other than schools, and maybe they'll learn better that way. And he became an advocate for the homeschooling and later the unschooling movement. So that's kind of a bit about John Holt and, and kind of how his writings changed over time. Right, so back to the themes that I noticed in John Holt's work. So the first one is what I call doing school, uh, and you'll see why in a second. So for John Holt, particularly in his early writings where he's writing journals first about how children learn in school in his book, How Children Fail, and then in How Children Learn, it's really journals of what students' learning looks like outside of school. He's really puzzled by this idea that students seem to be much more concerned with pleasing authority figures than actually learning. I think we all can think of examples of this, where it seems obvious that students are learning in ways and only in ways that will kind of pass the test and get them the right answer, at least as teachers want to see it, stuff like that. So. He describes it this way in a later section of his book, How Children Fail. He says, the smart and able ones, he's talking about students at least, come to look at school as something of a racket, which is their job to learn how to beat. 
and learn they do. They become experts at smelling out the unspoken and often unconscious preferences and prejudices of their teachers and, taking f and at taking full advantage of them. So kind of what he means there is that students learn that really what's important is pleasing the authority figures, like getting, you know, the actual answer and really learning stuff is kind of secondary to doing it the way the teacher wants it done. In fact, thinking too deeply about something could uh, be a detriment in schools because it, first of all, takes a lot of time. And second of all, may actually confuse you a little bit more. The important thing is to learn it only in the way where you get the right answer. Two other bits of research that I want to bring in here, because Holt obviously is not the only person who has seen this. I think actually most of us have seen it, that the best students are often not the students who know the most and learn the most, but really know the most about how school works and can navigate the system best. And some other researchers have really come up with the same conclusions. So uh, Philip Jackson is one who published a book called Life in Classrooms several years after Holt published How Children Fail. Philip Jackson was a psychologist, and he was an educational psychologist who wrote this book really simply by going into schools and hanging out in schools and seeing how teachers experience schools and how students experience schools and, and observing what typical days look like and things like that. And in this book, Life in Classrooms, Jackson came to the conclusion that students go through what he called the daily grind. And it's important to notice here that Jackson is not like trying to be down on schools at all. He's simply reporting what he sees. So the daily grind contains three elements. First, uh, students learn that, that school is really about crowd management. So they are one of many students and there are fewer teachers than there are students. And in some ways that means that they get to be corralled here and there. And, um, you know, teachers really manage the classroom. So everything has to go through the classroom. And that leads to the second thing, uh, the second component of the daily grind. The teachers are the one who controls the flow of activity, meaning the flow of activity is not up to the students. You have a schedule, you follow the schedule, even when you're in a class. If you want to speak, you raise your hand. The teacher has to call on you in order to speak. If you speak to your friend, if the teacher hasn't called on you, and the teacher says that's not permitted, then that's not okay. You do what the teacher tells you when the teacher tells you to do it. And your job is to kind of be managed by them and learn to, to go with that flow instead of your own flow. So if you're interested in something and the, the bell rings or the teacher says we're going to go on to the next thing, your job is to silence yourself and go on with that because that's what's important. And the third thing, which, which really goes to one of Holt's other points, is that uh, schools are what he calls sites of evaluation. So you are constantly evaluated based on how the teacher thinks you're doing, how you do on the tests, quizzes, and assignments, and also by your peers. And in some ways, you are constantly kind of measured against each other. Um, if you got a C on the test and you know Billy got a B on the test, um, that is in some ways another way of evaluation. Not only are you evaluated against the test, but you're being evaluated against your classmates. Another researcher who came up with something similar was uh, many decades later, Denise Pope came up with a book called Doing School. It's based on her dissertation research. So she followed around several high-performing high school students. She wanted to figure out kind of what are they doing in terms of learning that maybe other kids aren't. And what she found in some ways to her surprise um, is that these students were not necessarily better learners. They were just better at playing the school game. They were better at navigating things. So you have students who do things like they are really expert at knowing, at, at showing the teacher that they're paying attention, even if they're not paying attention, or they're really good at studying for tests and quizzes in a way where they can do awesome on the test and then forget about the stuff later because they can move on to something else. Or they're really good at multitasking. So it's not that they're really good at learning material, but they're just really good at figuring out how much math do I really need to learn in order to do well on the test and be able to do all this other stuff that I have to do for school as well. So in her work, which was subsequently titled as a book called Doing School, uh, she said that oftentimes, you know, what's what we're not really incentivizing is learning. What we're incentivizing is multitasking and doing well in tests and quizzes and the kind of superficial learning that will allow teachers to think that we know a lot about a subject when in fact maybe we don't actually know about it. So that's Holt's first theme, I think, is that students often realize that doing well in school and actually learning things in a really authentic way are not necessarily the same, and that obviously is, is troubling. The second theme from Holt, I, I think he makes less explicitly, but it's really an offshoot of the whole idea of doing school, 
And it's the impact of grades and things like time limits on learning. So Holt's first book, How Children Fail, we've established is, is a notebook about how children learn in school. And his other books have more or less been full of a lot of anecdotes about how children learn outside of school. And he doesn't really explicitly compare these in a systematic way, and I really think he should. And when I did it, it I realized that a lot of what he's talking about is really the negative impact of grading and time limits about, about learning on the learning process. So in order to explain this, let me give an example from How Children Learn, which was his second book. He's talking about a, a child with whom he's basically playing a game. It's an imitation game. He noticed that she would imitate whatever he was doing. So he would do increasingly complicated gestures and things like that to see if she could imitate it. And the, they got increasingly complicated and uh, he, he's describing this process. Here's what he says. Watching her do this, I was struck by two things. First, she did not feel she had to get everything right before she started to do anything. She was willing, no more than willing, eager, to begin by doing something and then think about fixing it up. Second, she was not satisfied with incorrect imitations, but kept on looking and comparing until she was satisfied that she was correct. So take that and compare it to an instance from his earlier book, How Children Fail where he's talking about how he was trying to get students to balance a particular beam. So they'd put some weight on one side and he wanted to get them to balance the other. So the first thing he wanted to get them to do is try some predictions. If they put this on one side of the beam um, and they put that on the other side, would it balance correctly? And he noticed before long that they weren't really guessing genuinely. They were just trying to get points for getting a good prediction. So they would do things like make a really vague prediction that would be correct only because it was vague. Uh, so he describes that situation this way. Our way of scoring was to give the groups a point for each correct prediction. Before long, they were thinking more of ways to get a good score than making the beam balance. We wanted them to figure out how to balance the beam and introduce that scoring as a matter of motivation but they outsmarted us and figured out ways to get a good score that had nothing to do with whether the beam balanced or not. So all of this got me thinking, and again, he doesn't make this very explicit, I wish he would, but one of the things that's, that's lacking in his first description of the child doing the imitation game that exists when the children are doing the balance beam exercise is that number one, there's, there's a, a grade, there's a point value for being correct and a penalty for not being correct. So think about how different that would have been with the child in the imitation game if part of the game was that Holt would reward her for being correct and not reward her for not being correct. Um, one of the things that he notes, and I notice with my son who's a little over one year old, is that you know, kids often will try stuff, sometimes without thinking about it very hard first. And if they fail, they'll stop and they'll think about it and then they'll try something a little bit differently. Again, they won't really think about it too hard. They'll just try it. And then they'll, again, they'll try and fail and try and fail until they get it right. Well, the only reason you can do that, it seems to me, is because you're not concerned with any point value of, try, of, of success and failure. If your goal is to succeed at the task because you want a reward, that's going to really affect what you're going to try. You're not just going to try stuff at random. You're not going to try out-of-the-box thinking because the goal is to get the reward and you want to avoid failure. So it seems to me that when kids learn in school, oftentimes the, the threat or, or pr promise of reward or failure is kind of helping to determine what they're going to be willing to try and what they're going to be willing to fail at. Um, another thing that's really missing in the imitation game that you really see in the balance beam thing is that the expectation is not only that you're going to get the right answer, but that there's a certain time frame that you have to get the right answer. So it's not like um, take as much time as you need to learn this thing. It's learn this thing by a week from now and then we'll take a quiz and then we'll figure out your reward or failure. And that affects learning process pretty well. So uh, it makes that reward or, or punishment more imminent. I have to learn the correct way to do this by a certain time. And if I don't, then I will be either rewarded or I will fail. I teach in a college of education, and two of the kind of buzzwords right now, uh, and rightly so, are growth mindset and grit. So let me explain these and how I think Holt's work relates. Growth mindset is an idea that was kind of discovered by a psychologist named Carol Dweck. She noticed that really in kids and adults, because this generalizes, 
that there's a difference between people who have what's called a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. A fixed mindset is the kind of mindset that says, however good I am at something is just how good I am at it. I'm never going to be able to get better at it. So there's no sense in really trying very hard. If I'm bad at math, I'm just not a math person. I'm going to move on to something else. If I'm not good at reading, well, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, reading's not my thing. I'm going to move on. Growth mindset is kind of the opposite. The growth mindset is a mindset that says, if I'm bad at something, I can get better at it through effort. So if I'm bad at math, um, I'm not going to dismiss math, dismiss math. I'm just going to figure out where my problems are. I'm going to work on those. I can actually get better at this subject. So uh, obviously we want to encourage that in education, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. Uh, the idea of grit is an idea pioneered by another psychologist named Angela Duckworth, and it's related. It's the idea that success is often correlated with your ability to persevere through challenges. So Angela Duckworth, Duckworth's equation is that grit equals passion plus perseverance. So what she's noticed, I believe, is that um, success, whether it's in school or career or whatnot, is most often correlated with perseverance, which is even a better predictor of success than things like IQ. And obviously we want to encourage people to have a growth mindset, know that they can get better at stuff over time, and also encourage perseverance because success is often um, a path that's paved by perseverance more than individual intelligence or something like that. So how does this relate to John Holt's work? I think what Holt is describing, uh, I think what Holt would say is that learning outside of school is probably the best guide towards encouraging a growth mindset and grit and learning in school probably discourages these things and thinking about it more and more and thinking about you know the idea of doing doing school i think he's maybe right so we can definitely encourage people to have a growth mindset and realize that they can get better at things if they just keep trying and keep trying and we can also encourage the idea of grit the idea that success is often simply gotten by perseverance over something the ability to fail and then try again and fail and try harder and try better but think about this i mean in school first of all we often put time limits on what it you know we're going to learn fractions by the end of next week which is when we're going to take our test and we obviously have a grade and a point value assigned to those tests and quizzes and assignments so uh, the point is to do well, uh, and to do well by a certain time. And it seems to me that these are in some ways always going to be antithetical to the idea of the growth mindset and to grit. Because if there is a penalty to every failure you have, then your goal is going to be less to learn and get better than to simply succeed. Because if I tell you that, you know, you're going to take a test in a week and a half and it's going to be worth 50 points, your goal at that point is going to be by a week and a half, I have to learn this. So I don't really have a lot of time to try and fail and try and fail. And I don't really have a lot of time to persevere because perseverance takes time. And I'm also gonna be very aware that the goal at the end of that week and a half is gonna to be to score well on the test rather than to maybe you know use that as a learning opportunity to try harder the next time because Nobody wants to get a low point value on a test, even if that could tell you something really important to your progress in math. So I think if we go back to John Holt's idea, the idea, the very idea that we have these time limits on what we're supposed to learn and how long it's supposed to take us, and that we're gonna be measured based on how we fit on that timeline, in some ways is gonna be antithetical to the kind of learning that we want, which is like the growth mindset, the grit kind of learning. Those things may be best outside of school. The last theme of Holtz that I think is really key to understanding his work is his belief that uh, children really want to join the world of adults. And that is one thing that usually uh, very consistently motivates them. They're very aware that they're kids and they really want to kind of join the network of adults. And he says several times in his books that if there's a role for a teacher, which he thinks should be a lot less than it currently is, it should be to provide them the best types of access to adult kinds of things. So if we want children to learn to read, the worst thing we can do is, you know, pick books that are kids' books and just kind of teach them to learn to read and that's what will happen. He thinks that what we should do is provide them with a whole lot of opportunities to read and we should help them when they want help in terms of learning to read. Same thing with math. So when we're talking about 
how to get kids to learn mathematics, the worst thing to do is start with kind of the theory and here's addition and here's subtraction. The best thing to do is provide them with a bunch of resources, particularly the more adult-like resources possible. So measuring cups, measuring tapes, um, things that measure stuff, things that would require math to be able to operate. Provide them with those opportunities, as many opportunities as we possibly can. And then instead of teaching them math, be there to kind of guide them through math. So they see us doing math and then they want to try to do some things that we're doing and then we guide them through those processes. If I were reading this a few years ago, I'm not sure that I would have you know, bought this, but I mentioned that I have a son at home who's a little over one year old. And I see that he consistently goes for adult things, probably more than kids things. So if there's something that adults are doing, he wants that. And uh, obviously there's reasons, you know, we can't, let kids take that full plunge, you know, plates can break and they're dangerous. Certain other things that they play with are dangerous. Certain other things that they want to play with are, are things that might be easily destroyable. So he wants to play with my books, but I'm always concerned that he's going to rip pages out of books that frankly, I don't want pages ripped out of. So obviously there's certain things that we can, that we probably need to keep him from. But I'm always amazed at how often it is that he wants to be part of the adult world. And if you look at a lot of kids' toys, I was looking the other day at a, a child who was uh, outside with his mother and his mother was mowing the lawn and he had his little lawnmower and he was mowing along with her and he didn't really understand what she's doing yet, but uh, he wants to be part of that world. So I, I do kind of agree with Holt here. I think that this is a really important point. And one of the things that it got me thinking about, in fact, was uh, many years ago, this was in the middle 90s, if you recall, when the Harry Potter books came out. Now, these were books that were kind of, I guess, written for a teenage audience, although really adults also started to read them. And uh, what we noticed was a lot of little kids started to read them. I know of adult or children as, as young as eight who were working their way through Harry Potter books. And these books were not written for with eight-year-olds in mind. They had complex wordings. They had complex language. They had no pictures, as, as a lot of books for eight-year-olds do. They're huge and thick, 300, 400-page books. Uh, and the plot lines and character structures are actually really complicated. They're, they're difficult. Um, in fact, I remember when Harry Potter first came out that there was a controversy where the publishers had to change the book covers, because the book covers were very kid-like, uh, kind of in a way like teenagers would want, kind of animated like a comic book kind of thing. And uh, adults didn't like this because they were carrying around these kids' books with these children's childlike covers on them, and they really didn't feel comfortable doing that. But you also notice that eight-year-olds never had a backlash about these covers look too adult-like, were really put off by these books because they're, they're adult-like. No. Kids wanted to read them because their older brothers and sisters were reading them and Harry Potter was all in the news and they fascinating stories and stuff like that. And it really jibes with um, another book that I've read by, I think Stephen Johnson is the author, that's called Everything Bad is Good for You. And Johnson is trying to convince us that things like video games and TV shows that, that we notice kids, teenagers, and even adults watching, people think that you know this is like dumbing down our culture. And he's trying to convince us, and I, he does a very convincing job in my view, these things are actually really complex. So if, if you even look at video games that kids play, um, they're really complex in terms of the, the different things you have to keep in mind in order to actually play these well. And the plot lines and the narrative structures are pretty complicated. Um, so we often do a really good job of trying to sanitize things for kids and making them really simple for kids when often um, kids are attracted to the more complicated stuff. They want to use their minds in ways they see adults and, and teenagers using their minds. This also reminds me of research done by a developmental psychologist named Susan Engel, who did a book called The Hungry Mind, which is all about the science of curiosity, what we know about curiosity. And she's done research and others have done research that indicates that uh, school-age kids are really actually drawn to complexity and nuance. So the you know we try to sterilize the textbooks and make them as simple and straightforward as possible because our conviction is that if it's too complicated, students aren't gonna be attracted to it, they're gonna give up easily, they're gonna go you know, with the fixed mindset kind of approach. And her research actually seems to show the opposite and so, do, so does the research of others that she goes into. So one bit of her research is uh, her and a team of researchers went into schools, into classrooms, into hallways, into the office, things like that. And she tried to, they tried to make note of where curiosity happens the most in schools and obviously the first sad news is that curiosity doesn't really happen very much in school at all. Kids learn at a very early age that curiosity 
in school is kind of a dangerous thing if you go off, because it leads you off topic. You, going back to Jackson's point, your job as a student is to kind of go along with the teacher. So curiosity is shut off at a very, very early age. But she did notice that there were areas in school that unexpectedly provided a lot of curiosity for students where they went and they expressed curiosity when they would ask questions, they'd be engaged with material. And she said that those were usually the areas that were the most nuanced and the most unpredictable and the most dynamic. So one of the areas she mentions in the book is uh, aquariums in the classrooms are often areas where students will congregate and they'll talk and they'll chat and they'll wonder what's going on and they'll wonder what fish are doing and they'll ask questions about fish and things like that. So um, those areas are, are areas of curiosity. Other researchers that go along with the Harry Potter example uh, find that students, when, they're, when they are reading a more sophisticated textbook where the meanings are not necessarily always obvious and things like that, they actually remember more, they're actually motivated more to read those books and um, they remember less, in fact, when they're reading books that, that are made simple and usually artificially simple because we're convinced that kids can't understand things. So I guess, you know, when, when I look at kids, I often, you know, marvel at how they really do like difficult things. If we give them difficult things to do, they'll do a pretty good job of chunking it down into component tasks. And again, trying and failing and trying better and failing and trying again. But uh, often this isn't the case in schools. I think I'll leave this video here um, with these three points. At least these were the three things I think that I got out of Holt in terms of the big themes. There are obviously others possible. Um, but really, I, I want to urge people, if you haven't read Holt, please do so. Um, probably start in order with how children fail and how children learn and kind of go on from there. And if you have read Holt, um, I would urge you to just you know go back and read him again with a really fine eye because I... I, uh, like I said, when I first read him several years ago, I think I missed, because of his conversational tone and, and idiosyncratic nature, that um, I missed that how nuanced of a, a thinker he is and how his examination of schools is really quite deep. And it's just more than, you know, children don't do well in schools. He, he really articulates some reasons why he thinks so. And I think there are really interesting reasons to consider.